Uh, good morning. How is everybody doing? Good. Great. Uh, my name is Sarah Ladislaw. I direct the Energy and National Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We're very pleased to have all of you here today. I uh, told Melanie it's uh, not a small feat to get uh, 100 plus people in a room in the middle of July for any good reason. So uh, there's clearly interest in uh, her talk today about energy security as it relates to the Quadrennial Energy Review. Uh, we were lucky enough to have Melanie come by in May of 2014 uh, and talk about this wonderful new process that they had launched called the Quadrennial Energy Review, which was really meant to be sort of a synthesis analysis of the U.S. energy system uh, and, uh, and looking at, in its first installment, uh, infrastructure uh, issues uh, and transmission issues in the U.S. Uh, and, uh, and to be quite honest with you, when we heard sort of the scope of the plan that they had laid out for achieving in the Quadrennial Energy Review, we sort of all snickered a little bit uh, because it was, a, in a year, actually taking on a fairly comprehensive review of what just seems like, oh, you know, oh, just the midstream. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, actually a hugely important uh, aspect of understanding how our energy system works or doesn't work, the efficiencies, the reliability issues, and as Melanie will talk a little bit about today, uh, some of the energy security issues. And lo and behold, as of April of this year, uh, they have accomplished uh, the first uh, part of the Quadrennial Energy Review. For those of you who haven't read the document or haven't used the document, I certainly commend it to you. Um, and in our work uh, at CSIS, I know I have personally, uh, I have a hard copy, so I pick it up occasionally and I uh, read it, use it as a reference document, uh, look at some of the, uh, the issues and policy recommendations that are in it. Uh, and so within just a short couple of months, it's become sort of a go-to reference document for folks who are uh, thinking about the U.S. energy sector in some uh, 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 serious and in-depth ways. Um, so we're very pleased to have Melanie back today uh, to talk about uh, uh, sort of the energy security aspects of what's in the Quadrennial Energy Review uh, and uh, hear a little bit about how the implementation is going and uh, what there are plans for next installments uh, of, uh, of the, the QER process. So we're having a little bit of technical difficulty with our microphone up here. Um, but Mariah, maybe if we could get a temporary mic for a minute just so she's able to give. Uh, I, I can do it from here. You can yeah, do it from yeah, here? If, if I have okay. something to move the slides. Okay, okay we can, fine. here, I'll give you this. Thank you for being so flexible. Here you go, you just sort of. same time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, thank you all very much for uh, for coming today. I feel very home uh, at home at CSIS. As Sarah said, I've been here before. Um, Secretary's been here several times, and and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today, um, and to not answer questions on today's announcement between the P5 plus one and Iran. <laughs> Um, I have not read the details, uh, and, uh, and I watched the news like you all did this morning. Um, uh, the secretary has been there for 18 days today. Um, uh, it's, uh, I've been working for Secretary Moniz for 18 years, and I realize this is the longest I've gone without talking to him in 18 years. And so... Uh, it's been, uh, I think that his effort and input will be worth it, and, uh, and we look forward to his return in, uh, for many, many reasons. Uh, it's been tough. Um, we have a very able deputy secretary uh, who has kept us in line while he's away, but we're looking forward to his return. Um, uh, I, I, I would like to, I'm happy to uh, answer questions uh, and discuss uh, uh, two key and related areas of focus um, that we've been working on at the Department of Energy. As uh, Sarah said, energy security and the quadrennial energy review. And, um, and I'm going to describe the QER very briefly uh, first. Um, uh, the, uh, as you all know in this room, you're all experts here. Our energy landscape has changed dramatically in the last decade. Um, I see a few people here I've been working with for a couple of decades, and um, I dare say uh, several people are shocked 
at the changes um, uh, that we've seen uh, from gas imports to gas exports. I actually wasn't shocked about that. Um, major increases in oil production, dramatic reductions in the cost of renewables and increases in their deployment, reduced demand for oil, 10% of our gasoline supply is from ethanol now. These are all positive changes, but these changes have come with a new set of challenges and a new set of vulnerabilities. That's why the President launched the QER, directed us to do it, put out a presidential memorandum in January of 2014. Um, uh, as Sarah said, the final QER product, uh, the first installment of the QER, we, we redefined Quadrennial. Um, we're doing four installments. Um, the Secretary was pretty firm that these comprehensive energy plans are too broad and don't have actionable, uh, uh, aren't as actionable as they might be. So, so we are happy to break this up into uh, more discrete chunks. Um, here we focused on TS&D infrastructure, and that's TS&D writ large. Um, uh, uh, pipes, wires, and um, uh, to a little bit to our surprise, we ended up spending a lot of time on railroads, inland waterways, and ports as well. Um, not something I would have thought I would have been doing when I was at the department 15 years ago. Um, it is an integrated systems analysis, and in the end, we didn't start out this way, but we ended up with four major focus areas, um, increasing infrastructure resilience, reliability, and security. Uh, those are the little pedals on the inside there. Um, modernizing the electric grid, that was our one concession to an actual physical infrastructure. Um, we, didn't, we don't have a chapter on gas pipes, for example, but we did electric grid because all other infrastructures depend on electricity. Um, uh, enhancing energy security, and that's both our physical infrastructures for that as well, as well as our diplomatic infrastructures. I'll say more about that in a minute. And improving shared transport infrastructures. That gets into the ports, waterways, barges, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, we also looked at North American integration. Um, there were over 60 actionable recommendations in the QER. I'll talk about a few of those, but I really am not here. You can look at the recommendations, um, and I can highlight a couple, um, but I'd like to weave uh, more of a, a, a story together here um, about energy security. And this, let me uh, a switch to, um, uh, to the Russian aggression in Ukraine. And uh, after that, we uh, the G7 energy ministers met in Rome in May of 2014, not long after we launched the QER. And from that meeting, we, uh, we uh, derived and, and released a set of energy security principles that we believe are modern energy security principles, um, not the oil uh, focus that we have had over uh, the last several decades. And um, uh, I've highlighted the words here, um, flexible, transparent, and competitive energy markets, including gas markets, diversification of energy fuel sources and routes, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, major threat multiplier um, uh, that we see in climate change, enhancing efficiency, um, promoting clean and sustainable energy technologies, improving energy system resilience, and emergency response systems. That goes more to oil, but some to gas these days, and I'll say uh, a few words about that. Um, I'm going to focus first on the uh, first two principles here. You can see them. I'm tracking them in shorthand across the top. And when we went, uh, we did follow up um, uh, the G7 leaders in 2014. Uh, this was in the, these principles were in their communique. They reinforced theirs in their communique in 2015. Um, and we went to Hamburg in 2015 to meet again with the G7 energy ministers and, um, and, and our deliverable at, um, at the G7 energy ministers was the QER. And so, so at that point in time, I crosswalked these principles to the QER uh, recommendations and findings, and that's what I'm going to show you here. Um, uh, this will be familiar to uh, many of you, but this is the importance of gas transmission infrastructure. This is in the QER. Um, that, that, those wide, that wide uh, basis differential uh, differences there in 2007, uh, you see a huge uh, uh, disparity in the various price points. 
uh, across the U.S. And then over here in 2014, you see them uh, narrow down at the bottom there. Um, the only real, uh, uh, the place where they don't narrow is in the Northeast in New England. You see up there in the upper right um, where their prices are, are much higher. That is because of infrastructure constraints. Um, you see a little blip there in Chicago, uh, Illinois, that, down, that gold line down there in 2014. Uh, that was a temporary aberration. Um, uh, but the, uh, the, uh, the Northeast and New England, that persists because of infrastructure constraints. We also think that the narrowing is due, it's in part due to infrastructure, but also in part that uh, shale gas resources are more widely distributed across the country. Um, these, are, these are what competitive uh, energy markets uh, do and low cost gas does for the United States. Um, you can't read this, um, but these are new industrial natural gas related projects announced or being uh, completed between 2015 and 2020. Those are chemicals, metals, uh, petroleum, and other industrial. There are a total of 405 projects. Um, uh, the, the, we are onshoring uh, uh, energy intensive and gas intensive industries uh, back to the U.S. Um, that represents an, an, an additional 4.7 uh, BCF a day of, uh, uh, of uh, gas demand, and uh, we think that that's easily achievable. Um, this, you don't have to read any of this um, other than, this is diversification of our liquid fuels infrastructure in the U.S. Um, our infrastructures have had to do a lot of catch up because uh, the, uh, the uh, oil, this is oil, liquid infrastructure, um, because we are producing oil in places where we have not traditionally produced oil before. And all you need to see there are the red lines. That, those are um, reversals or expansions of pipelines. And that's a lot of activity that you're seeing in order to accommodate uh, this new production. Um, as you can see, much of that is moving to the Gulf of Mexico. I'll say a little bit about that in a minute. This is a pretty uh, startling uh, a sequence of slides. This is crude by rail movements um, starting in 2010. Uh, what you see is a lot of uh, uh, the start of, of crude moving by rail down to the Gulf of Mexico. This is 2011. Um, you also see the Eagleford starting to move into the Gulf of Mexico there, but you're starting to see rail moving uh, from the Bakken to the east and west coasts. Um, 2012, huge amounts of oil starting to move to the Gulf Coast, both from uh, the Eagleford and from the Bakken. And then uh, 2013, look at what's happening um, on the east coast in particular, and then this is 2014. And, uh, and so uh, crude by rail is important for many, many reasons. It has been the, uh, the alternative to pipelines. We can't get them sighted that fast. Um, it has uh, kept uh, this, this movement to the East Coast refineries is by and large, not by and large, but in part due to the basis differential, the discount of, uh, of uh, Bakken crude to, uh, to uh, Brent, and, uh, and the East Coast refineries are taking advantage of it. So it illustrates many things, but I think that that's pretty amazing uh, how much is moving to the East Coast by rail. These are, uh, 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 as I said, we had to look at ports and waterways, um, uh, and, uh, and I would start by noting that these are, the ports and inland waterways are by and large federal responsibilities. A lot of what we uh, uh, looked at and recommendations are for private industry where much of our infrastructure uh, uh, is owned by private industry, but here, um, uh, the ports and waterways uh, are uh, federal responsibilities. This is a cartoon of the Lake Calcasieu uh, ship channel. And the left cartoon, uh, you know it's a cartoon because they're uh, not passing each other, they're going in the same direction. Um, but that is what the design specs are for that, uh, that channel. And um, on the right is a cartoon of what that channel looks like at points in the uh, at points in time along the channel. The ship channel operators call it self dredging. Um, uh, we're not uh, yes, and we didn't we didn't put that in the QER. They came in and they met with us. Um, but I would note that Lake Calcasieu is where your first LNG exports are going to be moving, and um, and uh, a lot of exports we uh, contemplate. 
um, moving through that ship channel. This is um, uh, a problem with funding, federal funding for this kind of uh, operations and maintenance responsibility here of the Corps of Engineers. Uh, they have uh, put some more money into uh, uh, O&M for the Calcasieu ship channel, um, but it's, a per it's an ongoing problem. The uh, ports in, uh, in uh, the Gulf of Mexico silt up more quickly than uh, uh, ports elsewhere, and so it is an issue. I checked the numbers right before I came. Uh, we have uh, given final approvals to 9.9 .9, uh, BCF a day of, uh, of exports. Um, that is approaching, if all of that gets built, that is, I think, a gutter is 10 or 11, and it's the largest LNG exporter in the world. So we are getting into that range. Much of that is going to be moving through ship channels like this. And, um, and uh, you, you all can look in the uh, QER itself, um, but we also looked uh, down, this graph you can't read, or uh, table you can't read in the lower left-hand corner, those are top 10 port systems by energy commodity shipments. That includes crude oil and petroleum right now. It doesn't include gas, and it includes coal. Uh, some of them uh, were surprising to me. Um, uh, Lake Charles is not surprising, but um, Huntington Tri-State in West Virginia, um, Virginia Beach, uh, uh, Port of, uh, let's see, look at Delaware River, um, some that you would not uh, necessarily think are large energy ports. Those are going to be competing for funds with the, um, with the Panamax ships and the container ports um, uh, as uh, we widen the Panama Canal. Uh, we also looked, as I said, at North America, uh, North American in Energy Integration. We have signed an MOU with Canada and Mexico to expedite this and our cooperation on climate um, issues, and uh, that was at the CEM in Mexico uh, a couple months ago. This just shows you the enormous energy trade. The dark purple there, that is crude oil movements, and the, the size of the arrows are significant. Um, gold is refined product, green is natural gas, and the thin uh, black strings, you probably can't see them well, that's electricity. Um, very important for the U.S. and for clean energy. Canada exports about 10% of its electricity to the United States. That's all hydro. Um, so we are getting uh, CO2 benefits from their uh, hydro exports to the U.S. And um, four out of seven... NERC regions, I believe, are completely integrated with Canada. So um, we will uh, be looking at electricity in QER2. And uh, so this kind of integration, electricity integration, uh, is important. Let me turn to um, the uh, Europe for a switch back and forth a little bit uh, uh, to our G7 energy principles. And um, uh, I met yesterday with uh, uh, the foreign minister of Bulgaria, uh, Daniel Mitov. He's going to be speaking here later. Um, we talked about many issues. Um, Southern Corridor and interconnections in Europe is one of them. Um, uh, the, uh, obviously, we are all, this is uh, the Southern Corridor and the various pipelines. We are all concerned about um, diversification of supplies and routes. That's an energy principle in, from the G7, also something that we looked at in the QER. And, um, and you can see how important this is from uh, Chardonnay's, uh, the Trans-Anatolian Pipeline, uh, uh, Trans-Adriatic, and how, um, and actually Italy has approved uh, the TAP um, uh, entry point there, and how you can move um, gas from, from Azerbaijan and elsewhere, uh, non-Russian gas, into Europe and uh, very important for energy security, diversity of supplies and routes. Um, I would say that, that uh, uh, as recently as March of 2015, uh, President Erdogan in Turkey uh, acknowledged um, a couple of things, and, and uh, Turkey's desire to be an energy distribution hub. They've been talking about being a gas hub for many, many years now. And um, at the Tr Trans-Anatolian Pipeline has special importance because of its root and its goal. It is not an alternative project to others. There is no alternative to it. This is an important uh, message from the president in the context of Turkish Stream, um, and uh, and uh, we're looking forward to working through the uh, southern corridor issues uh, with Turkey and all the countries involved. 
Um, in that regard, uh, uh, t uh, and I, I uh, use this slide in Turkey, um, I, I wanted to describe for them precisely what you needed uh, to have an extremely robust gas hub. Uh, the U.S. is obviously the most robust in the world. But this is what uh, Henry Hub is. Henry Hub is nine interstate pipelines, four intrastate pipelines, two compressors, and the capacity to transport 1.8 BCF a day um, of natural gas. That is an incredibly robust hub. Uh, Turkey, if it wants to be an energy hub, gas hub, as President Erdogan says, needs uh, uh, multiple pipelines and multiple sources of supply. Uh, Eastern Europe, uh, I mean, Eastern Mediterranean, North Africa, uh, Russia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and, uh, and so that's important for, uh, for Turkey's aspirations to be a hub. Also important is the understanding of market power, and I thought it would be uh, 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 important uh, to understand the definition, not understand it, just repeat it, you all understand it. It's the ability to engage in unilateral anti-competitive behavior. Um, uh, uh, Turkey wants to be a hub, Europe wants the, uh, the uh, southern corridor, we need diverse routes and diverse sources of supply. Um, that's problematic right now with uh, the Russian monopolies in many areas. Um, turn to uh, three uh, principles in um, uh, the G7 principles on clean energy, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, enhancing energy efficiency, and promoting clean and sustainable energy technologies. And I'm going to crosswalk these to what we have in the QER. Um, this is hard to read, but the map on the left, upper left, that is Indianapolis. The map on the right is Boston. The yellow dots are methane leaks from the local distribution system. And, um, and, uh, it, uh, and, and Indianapolis looks great uh, in, this, in this depiction here. What I would say, however, is that Indianapolis had a gas leak and explosion in the 1980s. And so it launched a pipeline replacement program in the 80s. Um, uh, Massachusetts has launched a pipeline replacement program. I think it was 2009. Um, they have reduced their methane emissions uh, substantially. This just shows you how important those pipeline replacement programs are. It's important from a safety perspective. It's important from a, from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective. Um, one of the recommendations in the QER is to, re, uh, to accelerate the replacement of this aging infrastructure. The uh, graph down in the uh, lower left that you can't read, um, that shows the timelines for uh, various uh, pipeline replacement programs of utilities across the country. The top one is 80 years. Um, and so we would like to accelerate um, those replacement programs. There's incentive structure in the QER. And when I, I started working on this, I assumed that those, pipe, those needs for pipeline replacement would be in old cities in the Northeast and Upper Midwest. That's not the case. Um, these are the top 10 states for uh, cast, uh, cast and wrought iron on the left and bare steel on the right. Bare steel, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Texas, Kansas, California, West Virginia, Oklahoma, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. So these are very widely distributed across the country and it's an important thing to do. Um, uh, very briefly, this is just a pie chart. It's a survey of the range of uh, entities involved in transmission. And, um, and not surprisingly, these are transmission investment drivers for them. The highest is not surprisingly reliability. 48% uh, mentioned reliability as their num number one concern. Surprising to me was number two, which is renewables integration. So they are very much focused on integrating renewables into um, the transmission uh, grid. Um, this is, uh, I think, the last slide that you won't be able to read. But this is, we spent a fair amount of time uh, in QER1 looking at valuing uh, a, a range of services and technologies that are very difficult or uh, unevenly valued across the different states. And, and um, these, these are, uh, it's microgrids, uh, ancillary services, um, uh, CHP, 
uh, distributed generation, storage, efficiency. And, and so we would like to, in QER2, focus a great deal on frameworks for consistent valuation of all of these services. And that's important because of this slide. Um, the maps, look at the maps on the, the right. The middle map is the uh, uh, electric grid, the uh, uh, infrastructure, transmission infrastructure. The top and bottom maps are the different jurisdictions. The top one is the NERC regions. The bottom is the RTOs. And what you see there is there is no relationship between how the electrons are flowing in the country and how our jurisdictions are structured. You have um, 50 states on top of this. And so, and we did not recommend that we get rid of the, uh, these regulatory and, and, uh, and reliability structures. We did recommend that we convene. We, um, we DOE work with other agencies and states to develop these uh, and, and uh, frameworks for valuing all these services because without that we can't, take at, we can't take full advantage of the technologies and services that exist. Um, and then finally, in oops, let's go, oops, this one, um, I love this picture. Um, this is the largest wind turbine blade in the world. It's 80 meters long. In the 80s, um, wind turbine blades in the U.S. were uh, 5 to 15 meters long. They average about 60 meters long. This is in Europe. It's for an offshore wind farm. It just shows you the enormous logistical issues associated with moving these blades around the country. 40% of the value of wind turbines, we import most of them, 40% of the value of those imports moves through Houston. They have a lot of wind generation in, in Texas, but they are moving elsewhere as well. This puts enormous strain on our roads. A lot of these are moving on rural roads and on, on the services, police, et cetera, et cetera, for moving these around. Wind turbine blades right now have to be moved in one piece in order to withstand the force. It's getting difficult to find cranes to move these off of, um, off of docks, et cetera, et cetera. And so, so this, we're, we're, we're going to look at, do a transportation corridor study for this and are looking at R&D uh, 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 to, um, to uh, figure out if we can break these into pieces. Um, you have similar issues associated with moving around very large transformers, um, another uh, issue that we looked at. Um, uh, this, this, going back to Europe again, this is lowering energy intensity and efficiency, um, and it can enhance energy security. Um, this is energy, uh, the intensity is uh, tons of energy per thousand U.S. dollars here. What you see here, the uh, OECD Europe is 0.09, and you look over at Ukraine, it is 0.8. Uh, Bulgaria, 0.4, enormous differences in energy intensity, particularly in Eastern European countries. Uh, 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 we should have a major focus and do or working with the Ukrainians on reducing their energy intensity, um, uh, very important in particularly in Eastern Europe. Improving energy systems resilience, this is a, another principle, promoting infrastructure modernization uh, and, and uh, uh, to, uh, to withstand systemic shocks. Um, this is a billion dollar disaster event types by year, 1980 to 2014. These are all weather events, and we, we saw uh, clearly you get over there 2010, 2011, you see a dramatic increase. It has been declining, and the, the thing that jumps out at me here, and we've seen it in, in, uh, in this area, the yellow on those bars, which re remains very high and increasing, those are severe storms. And so you might see a decline in some of the others, but severe storms, you still see it's a huge chunk of the, the billion dollar weather events and it's increasing. We saw that in Hurricane Sandy. We saw it in the derecho here. I had to move out of my house. I don't know about you. And we had a storm the other night that was where we had 74 mile per hour winds, the most severe storm since the derecho. That's very, very costly. Um, this is a weird slide, uh, and um, I'll tell you what it is in a minute. That little dot in the middle, that's Cushing, Oklahoma. Those lines are recorded tornado tracks. 
And um, I went through, and, and the question is not uh, uh, whether, but when, uh, Cushing, where we store an enormous amount of our oil, um, what, when it gets hit by a tornado, um, I looked at a many, many uh, large tornadoes very nearby, as you can see from the tracks, and uh, this illustrates a problem with severe storms and our energy security and resilience. Um, that, that just came up, we call that our pestilence slide. Um, the orange is wildfires, green is earthquakes, um, gold is tornadoes, uh, purple is hurricane. All of those have different impacts on energy infrastructure, we looked at the, the variations in, and, uh, uh, in the QER and uh, say earthquakes, for example, particularly problematic for pipelines. Um, wildfires, you had a fire 150 miles away from San Francisco and they declared an emergency in San Francisco because it was threat, that wildfire was threatening the transmission lines. Uh, hurricanes, we know what happened in Sandy um, and uh, tornadoes we just discussed. We also did fuel re regional fuel resiliency studies, and we are now doing cost-benefit analyses on some of these. Um, the southeast, this is for liquid fuels, uh, particularly vulnerable because it's only served by a couple of product pipelines and is not, not uh, uh, enormously served by imports. So, so you get a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, and we did have a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, cut off supplies to um, uh, 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 product supplies to the southeast, uh, major price spikes at, at when that occurred. Um, uh, the Upper Rocky Mountains, I was surprised by this. Many of the cities in the Upper Rocky Mountains are served by only one pipeline. Um, we think they could recover very uh, relatively quickly, but that's something we would like to keep an eye on. And then the far west, well, we are actually in the middle of a cost-benefit analysis on a on uh, a regional product reserve um, for the far west. It's obviously isolated um, uh, both geographically and uh, infrastructure-wise, and so and it's very earthquake-prone area. So we're looking at that as well. These are. Uh, 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 this is sea level uh, rise and inundation, um, Gulf of Mexico. This is hard to read, but what you see there, those yellow dots are 2030 vulnerabilities. The green dots are existing baseline vulnerabilities, and those are electricity substations. And so we're very uh, concerned about sea level rise, and, um, and this is another. We have recommendations for infrastructure hardening. The industry has done a fair amount um, at this point in time, but we see uh, continuing vulnerabilities with sea level rise. I then went back last night and looked to see what the Europeans are doing um, on climate and resiliency. Uh, I looked at their spending. Um, adaptation, which is what we have recommendations on in the QER for things like hardening, they're only spending uh, about 400 million euros. Um, that's over there, second to, to right, um, putting a lot of money in sustainable transportation, renewable energy, and research and development. And, uh, and adaptation comes up short. Our recommendation in the QER, however, is very similar, uh, $350 million a year for 10 years for hardening infrastructure uh, in ways that would uh, take care of some of the substation issues I just showed you. And finally, putting in place emergency response systems. Um, this is including reserves and fuel substitution. Um, this is another amazing slide. This is from the Keystone EIS. The upper, uh, upper left-hand corner is 2010, and those are the number of crude oil rail loading stations. There were six of them. 2013, three years later, um, those are your crude oil rail loading stations, and you can barely see them, but the little green triangles, those are barge and crude loading stations as well. And um, I, I didn't show you this to talk about rail. I showed you this to talk about changes in our energy flows. This is important for the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. All of this, and you saw going from the Eagleford as well, going from north to south, um, as opposed to our south to north historical patterns, moving into the Gulf of Mexico, Eagleford moving into the Gulf of Mexico. So you have congestion of commercial facilities in the Gulf of Mexico, and the SPR is sharing those commercial facilities. And so what we, what we were concerned with, and there are recommendations 
in the QER on modernizing the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, its infrastructure. Um, right now, um, it has a uh, it has a drawdown capacity, design capacity of 4.4 million barrels a day. Um, we think that its uh, distribution capacity is far less than that. And it's very important in a modern global oil market. The laws, triggers, et cetera, designed for the uh, SPR uh, were written in 1975. When we did not have, we were not participating in a global oil market. Uh, we are now doing that to prevent econo economic harm to the U.S. economy, which is the test in the uh, statute. You really need to get oil on the water. And uh, to get oil on the water, you need dedicated to ensure um, that you can get incremental SPR oil onto the water, you need dedicated docks. And so we recommend funding for dedicated docks. There, when we did the test sale for the SPR, um, we found that pipelines that serve the SPR distribution system had been reversed. And so there are uh, uh, both uh, modernization issues and, um, and ongoing uh, maintenance issues and life extension issues for the SPR. We need to be very mindful of the SPR is 40 years old. And so major recommendations on moving incremental barrels of oil into the market. One thing we also found is that the, the uh, distribution capacity of the SPR now, because we have global oil markets and we're exporting a lot of product out of the Gulf of Mexico, is its distribution capacity is greatly affected by where a disruption occurs. We still import oil from Venezuela into the Gulf of Mexico where we refine it. Um, we don't import a lot of oil from the Middle East into the Gulf of Mexico. So if you had a disruption in Venezuela, you would have more space to distri distribute SPR oil than if there was a disruption in the Middle East. And so it's now kind of uh, a location specific as to what its distribution capacity is, and we would like to increase that. Um, finally, uh, this last slide, I lied and said there would, wouldn't be any more you couldn't read. Um, uh, but this is about natural gas in Europe and its growing importance as an energy security problem. And I'm just gonna read you what it says down there. Energy markets have changed substantially since the creation of IEA. Uh, natural gas is playing an ever-growing role in the energy balance of IEA countries, making gas security a key element in energy security. Unlike the case of oil, there is no framework for taking collective action for, um, for uh, natural gas. And this, this uh, graph is import diversity of supplies, and it's the HHI index as you approach one or hit one, that means there's only one supplier. And you can look, those little uh, triangles there are a lot of Europe where there's only one supplier or huge, per you're approaching one in many, many locations. And so, so we are uh, very focused on natural gas uh, security as well. That goes back to the Southern Corridor, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, so let me just close by saying each of these um, recommendations uh, can contribute to the uh, nation's overall security. I am quoting the secretary here. Um, he did give a big speech on this at EIA at their annual conference. Um, he said, it's our hope that our energy security investments and policies will be viewed in the broader sense to value and include the resiliency, reliability, and modernization of key energy infrastructures, responses to climate change, and the collective needs of our allies and partners. Thank you all very much, and look forward to questions. Thanks very much, Melanie. That was an amazing amount of information in a short period of time. Um, and I think perhaps the most relevant for a lot of folks in the audience here is I look out lots and lots of energy expertise, some internationally focused, some very domestically focused, to see how you all are thinking about the Quadrennial Energy Review as it relates to some of the international uh, remits and, and pressing issues for the administration, including European energy security vis-a-vis -vis what's happening in Russia. I, I wonder, and I don't hope this isn't putting you on the spot too much, could you talk a little bit about what is happening within that G7 process and in terms of 
how you've explained that the QER feeds into this broader notion of energy security that you're all trying to think about. And, and is this an ongoing process? We've all saw what happened in the summit, but what are the next steps? Is there something further uh, that you'll be doing to sort of develop these concepts as well, it relates we, to your... We, um, we actually, I have briefed the, the European Commission uh, also participated in both G7 meetings. So, so they're very engaged on this as well. And, um, and they have put out their projects of common interest, uh, very focused on the gas infrastructure uh, issue. Um, uh, I actually, uh, uh, when we were at Atlantic Council uh, uh, last November, um, we met with uh, uh, Foreign Minister uh, Mitov. The secretary offered me up to go over and uh, talk to them about doing their own uh, energy plan like the QER. And, um, and so we, I did go to Bulgaria. That's why I was, uh, that's, I, I have been working with the Bulgarians. Um, the most horrible thing for me, however, was that I had to go uh, to Bulgaria the week before the QER was rolled out by the vice president. And, um, and so I was trying to get the rollout of the QER done here while we were there meeting with the Bulgarians. They were very interested in doing a, a, a soup to nuts energy plan like this, taking it as we tried to do and I think successfully did out of the kind of political, raising it a level above the political process. There are obviously in Bulgaria a lot of uh, different currents on energy. And, um, and I was surprised when we went to Bulgaria how interested they were in the process. And, um, and so because, because and, and I've heard the same thing from the European Commission and from, uh, and from IEA talking with uh, Fatih Birol. Um, that this kind of process is very helpful um, uh, for looking at the need for integration of these systems. Um, things that we didn't know, that we now know, I did not, as I said, we did not start out thinking that shared transport was going to be a focus area of this QER. I dare say when you do this kind of analysis and you do systems analysis, you're going to find things like that. So, so we have been working, um, uh, I've been to Turkey uh, uh, talking about the QER there and, um, and the secretary uh, at G7 and we continue to work together on, on, on a range of issues um, in particular, the uh, the uh, gas um, gas infrastructure in Europe. The uh, we also continue to work with the Ukrainians. Uh, we have a team over there right now. Uh, we sent this team over there earlier. Um, they're back again, as you all know. Uh, there is yet again a dispute um, between Russia and Ukraine on gas. Uh, I believe they shut off, uh, Gazprom shut off the gas last week. Uh, you're not seeing a huge impact right now because they don't need gas for heat. Um, uh, but uh, we have a team over there. Uh, it's the Ukrainians' uh, job, but we are advising them on kind of worst case scenarios, options for action, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we sent this team before. They put together, uh, the Ukraine government put together a plan and we're back there looking at it again uh, in anticipation of this winter. Um, and so, so we work with a lot of the countries. We talk to the EU um, often and, uh, and have some very specific asks um, that we're working on as well. So. But one of the other questions I had was about the context in which the study was written and its robustness to sort of some of the changes that have happened in energy markets between when you started out uh, and uh, and today. Uh, we similarly had a midstream oil market uh, uh, study that we were doing here and, and uh, quickly read it through once the oil price collapsed to make sure that everything was still, uh, uh, still accurate as when we wrote it. Um, given the fact that there's a lot of folks thinking about whether or not the U.S. is going to be in a fundamentally different position than it's been in for the last three years with a you know, precipitous mm -hmm. surge in oil and gas production and the, the price drop that you've seen, is there anything about the next round of the QER, you said you focus on, on electricity, or, or this last uh, study that you think uh, has changed in light of that new oil and gas uh, 
reality or the ways in which people are talking about it? Or do you think that it uh, that it's robust and resilient against yeah, those Actually, changes? I think that the um, uh, it is pretty robust and and. Uh, as, as uh, uh, many people here in the room were working on gas imports in, uh, in uh, 2003, 2005, um, I believe Lee Raymond in 2005 said that, that North America was running out of natural gas um, and that we had to develop a global LNG import infrastructure. Um, that's really, that's 10 years ago. Um, uh, look where we are today. Uh, we have approved uh, uh, 10 BCF a day of uh, LNG exports in the U.S. I also think something like the slide, the, uh, the oil loading stations by rail, um, uh, in three years, you saw a huge, huge um, uh, increase in, in shipping oil by rail. What I would say is that's a fixed system, and it did have impacts on other commodities. And, uh, and uh, uh, the, the uh, railroads have invested money uh, in, in uh, expansion, et cetera, et cetera, um, as a result of the, the impacts on commodities, and we'll continue to uh, closely monitor that, had impacts on coal. It had impacts, uh, I think, uh, Powder River Basin coal goes by rail to about 34 states. Um, has an impact on ethanol. 70% of ethanol is transported by rail. Has an impact on uh, agricultural products. Something that I found in common with that and the Bakken uh, oil is a lot of that's in the Midwest. And, um, and, and so, uh, so, but I think that it has adjusted fairly well. Um, there are issues. Um, there are rail safety issues. There are competition with commodity issues. Four small units, uh, coal units, uh, in uh, 2014 had to shut down because they didn't think they could get the coal for, uh, for the winter because, because of competition. Uh, so you have to be, uh, look at those issues um, and reliability, but I think our system has demonstrated uh, that it, it is robust. Um, where I see the biggest concern is in areas like the, the things that are pure federal responsibility. You're operating under uh, 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 sequestration and budget caps, and, uh, and uh, all of these issues have to be balanced against each other. And, uh, but when you, when you see uh, uh, the operations and maintenance needs um, on, uh, on uh, the SPR, the, the deferred maintenance on uh, our ports and waterways, um, I think that we should be paying uh, a lot of attention to that. It's not only important to energy, that's my focus, but it's important to commerce. And so, so uh, that's where I think um, uh, industry's pretty good about coming in. You see some dislocation, and, and, uh, but I think that, that the industry has demonstrated its ability to accommodate. Um, uh, there are not requirements uh, everywhere for hardening, for resilience, for example. So, so there are recommendations in the QER to incentivize that. We're never going to pay for all of it. Industry has to do that. But we, we provided in, uh, recommendations on incentives in there and are working with Congress on those and other issues. They're working on energy bills now. So, so. We've got about 10 minutes for questions. Please uh, state your name and affiliation and your question in the form of a question. We'll start with Ben. Thanks, Thanks so much, Sheldon. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Oh, excuse me. Hey, Ben. You have done a phenomenal job, as Thank Sarah you. pointed out, presenting an incredible amount of information in a short period of time. And also, the project is, is, uh, is, is really impressive. I had two uh, things that struck me. One is on Turkey, back to right. you know, gas diversification of gas supplies. We've worked with utilities, as you know, for many years, and, and uh, you know, price is extremely important. Um, it's the second most important thing they worry about. The supply security is the most right. important thing. All the way back to Boston's issues in 1971, and what happened when you actually run out of gas as a utility. So these guys understand this, people, people in the gas industry. Um, is there some way to tie up two minor, one major thing and one minor thing? The major thing is there's some way to tie more closely together European recognition of Turkey's potential role in this. You put your finger on it directly. We've spent a lot of time speaking with people in Botash and other entities in Turkey, um, including giving class and stuff on what it takes to run a hub. 
you know, and, right. uh, and the market freedom to operate is, ex as you point out, is extremely important, uh, multiple supplies. Imagine from the Europeans, we've got to get Europeans to imagine if they had hubs on either end, freely operating hubs, you know, NBP on one end, a Turkish hub on the other end, how it would help their gas supply security. It would, it would help, help gas price, too. That, that's why price. I put up the definition of market power, because, yeah. It would also help yeah. price. And the second thing, just minor point, um, methane leakage, certainly from safety perspective, greenhouse gas perspective. There's a third perspective, the ratepayer perspective. This pays uh, to get rid of. You've got a $90 billion industry. If you're losing 2% up in God knows where, that's, that's uh, a crazy waste of ratepayer money. And somehow, Maybe rate pairs need to focus on that as well. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. On, on uh, Turkey, I, I think that it, um, uh, it's beneficial for the Europeans, but it's also beneficial for Turkey. And I didn't, I didn't put it in this slide um, when I spoke in uh, Istanbul in May. The, I looked at their trading partners, Turkey's uh, trading partners by far. By far, the biggest trading partner they have is Europe, the EU 28, and and um, and so there is enormous uh, relationship between uh, uh, next next between EU and then it's Russia, like you know one eighth or whatever, and only slightly behind that the U.S. I was surprised uh, that that um, they're they're trading with Russia, and U.S. was roughly equivalent. Um, but I think it has to be mutually beneficial to both the Europeans and the Turks. And, um, and when you look at it, there are obvious reasons um, and beneficial reasons for both sides to continue to work uh, forward, um, push forward uh, uh, the southern corridor. Um, uh, the uh, Turkish stream, the, the Turks might need it to satisfy their own um, uh, domestic demand, but that's not going to satisfy their desire to be a hub. And the problem right now, developing uh, natural gas in that region, it's a little, uh, uh, it's, it's not the uh, most stable part of the world in, and, uh, in the Eastern Med uh, or North Africa. So, um, but, but um, there will be some LNG imports from the United States on the way. So, so anyway, I, I agree. Um, we need to push forward on it. I think that we have to demonstrate that it's beneficial to both Turkey and the Europeans. And, um, and uh, I was uh, uh, glad to see President Erdogan's comments. Same. And on, on the methane leakage, um, ratepayer perspective is important. Uh, what we did hear from was the consumer advocates. Our focus the consumer advocates are concerned about the rate shock of accelerating uh, these replacement programs. Nationwide, we estimated it's a $270 billion price tag to replace um, uh, all of these uh, pipelines, uh, LD, uh, local distribution systems, and that's a lot of money. And, uh, and so the recommendation that we have in the QER is to buy down that rate shock for people that can't afford it um, uh, under the theory that that would give the PUCs uh, more incentive to move forward with it if they weren't, um, if they weren't uh, putting rate increases on those that could least afford it. Um, so there is a rate payer benefit, but there's also a, a consumer, a near-term consumer cost. So. Got about five minutes left, so I'm going to take the gentleman in the orange tie and this lady over here, and then you, if you can keep your questions very, very brief. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard Kidd, United States Army. Glad I wore my orange tie today. Okay. So, Melanie, real quickly, what is your comments or impressions about the interagency collaboration and the drafting of this document, given that there are two other quadennial reviews, one by State Department, one by the Department of Defense, all three documents mention energy security and the security threats from climate change. Do you think we as a federal government have got a whole of government effort yet on those particular topics and energy security? Thanks. Okay, and then Jao right here. The, we, um, there were 22 agencies. QER was a White House-led process, and there were 22 agencies uh, engaged in the task force. That, um, that the document went out to inter, for interagency review. It's a 348-page document, and um, I have to tell you that return from Bulgaria was tough, and uh, getting all of those comments um, adjudicated 
was a major undertaking. Um, uh, we, we actually got 1,500 comments. Uh, 600 of them were from us and were largely editing and EIA doing another round of you know, fact checking, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, 300 roughly for, were from the agencies. I found all of the agency comments to be incredibly helpful. We did the analysis in my office, and um, but we're not experts on what you do. And so, so uh, uh, the interagency process I found to be very, very valuable. It was tedious and very hard to get done in the time frame that we had to do it, but uh, uh, exceedingly important to the final product. The the um, uh, QDR, uh, f for example, that's an internal document. Um, it informs your budget. This is very, very different. Um, it's an outwardly focused document. Uh, 22 agencies have equities in energy, and um, and uh, and DOE doesn't own the assets. It doesn't it doesn't even own the regulatory structure by and large, and so um, so by the, by uh, for all of those reasons, it's a very different document than the QDR. Um, but we would love we I have actually sent staff over uh, a week or so ago to talk with the Defense Department staff on energy supply chains. We're very interested in that. You all are doing a lot of work there and would love to work uh, further. Also on energy security, I did find a couple of very good DOD documents. Um, we're looking at energy security valuation as well in our next steps. Um, uh, implementation of the QER, not valuation just of oil, but of other things that I mentioned there in the G7 principles and the DOD document, uh, very concerned about the energy and national security implications of a reliable electric grid, for example, and the pipes that serve it. And so we're, we're, I'm going through right now and reading uh, numerous uh, documents, uh, literature search on energy security valuation, the value of efficiency, the value of diversity of fuels, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and that's why we started working with uh, you all. Uh, supply chains are very important, too. So. Melanie, if you're able to go over by five sure, minutes, I'll I'm, take these I'm last fine. two questions as a group. Thank, Thank you. you for taking my question. I was just wanting to get more details on what the next installment of the QER will be about and the time frame when you plan to put that out. Well, we have, it has to be done in 16 months. Um, I can give you that for sure. Um, the, we're going to focus on electricity. We are at this point in time um, uh, working on a scoping document, so I don't have all the details uh, uh, as to what would, would uh, 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 be in the final scope. And, uh, and uh, my office does an enormous amount of electricity work, regardless of whether it's QER-related work or not. And, uh, and so um, that's, that's all I know at this point. I, we should be, um, when the secretary gets back this evening, we'll probably know more in short order. Thank you. Great, we've got one final question here. Uh, thank you, Matt Wall, President hey, of the Matt. Institute. Thank you, we join you in hoping that the secretary will end his self-imposed exile. Yeah, um, right, right. What can the department do to fix the QER which appears to have a problem. It proposes up to $7 billion in federal spending to prop up infrastructure to move coal and natural gas. This has the effect of cutting the market price of systems that use coal and natural gas, and cutting that price by a taxpayer subsidy nibbles away at the nuclear side, which does not require any help moving its fuel. So the, re the result may end up being counterproductive. How do you fix that? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what subsidies you're talking about it, that are it, recommended in the QER. It calls for federal spending of up to $7 billion to improve ports, uh, canals, rail lines, and pipelines. It's in the recommendations. Well, those, um, uh, actually the recommendations on ports, it doesn't uh, have $7 billion of recommendations no, for two ports to five, and inland waterways. Two point five up for one and 3.5 for the other. I, I, I don't think that we recommend that, okay? Uh, the ports and waterways, um, that's where you, you get into enormous benefits from shared infrastructure. 
Uh, it doesn't just it doesn't just accrue to the benefit of coal. It accrues to, as I said, the benefit of ethanol, um, uh, uh, agricultural products, um, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, and uh, we did not no look at nuclear because we did not do generation. And uh, the recommendations on ports and, and waterways uh, were to look at innovative funding mechanisms for for ports and inland waterways. The Congress, as you probably know, just passed an increase of a user fee. It's not a uh, it's not um, uh, at ports. There's a, uh, a a trust fund for maintaining ports. Uh, so that neither of those are. Uh, uh, one is an ad valorem tax, I believe, and the other is a, uh, a user fee. So, so those we don't recommend increases in either of those. We look, we recommend innovative funding mechanisms for how you might deal with it. But I would take issue with um, those being a direct subsidy for coal and for natural gas. It is, it is um, uh, essential to energy reliability, energy security, and um, and for a lot of, and for commerce, so. Well, Melanie, we know you've got a lot of demands on your time, especially with the secretary coming back uh, after such a period of time away. I wanna thank you for spending your time here today, and I just wanna say personally, the, the idea that you uh, put on the table about trying to calculate the value of some of these other characteristics of the system is, uh, uh, something that comes up uh, often in our seminars here and, and uh, seems like a really important innovation. So We would, lo we would love to uh, work with you all on that. So love to, great. absolutely. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Melanie for your time.